Jim's gonna go first. Jim. So you're, Jim, you're gonna go first. Number one, number two. Yeah. And uh, all you have to do is, you can leave the mic on. It might please save the battery if you turn it off and then turn it on just before you go in. Okay. Ready for the formal and wave at our uh, webcast camera people there. Um, so my name is Jennifer Dill, Dill. I'm a faculty member in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleagues Chris Monsier and Rob Bertini, we help co-organize this weekly transportation seminar. So welcome to um, everyone. Those of you who are regulars have heard me uh, do this spiel a few times. Um, the other thing I will remind everyone and to our newcomers is that we do webcast the seminars which is one reason we're in this room with the cameras and everything. And it's the other reason we ask you, when you do ask questions at the end of the presentation, that you use the microphone that is hopefully sitting in front of you and that you hold the touch button down, keep the red light lit so that the people watching on the web can hear your question. Um, and we do have people who do watch on the web, so we're not making you do this uh, just to torment you. And sometimes I will pipe up if I don't see you doing that. So. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our two speakers. We actually have a substitution today. Um, so instead of Jill Pearson, we actually have James Whitty, who is the manager of the Office of Innovative Partnerships and Alternative Funding for ODOT, which oversees the um, Road User Fee Task Force program. And Jim has been part of and sort of overseeing the Rough Tough project from the beginning, so he has quite um, a background um, in this. So. Um, we have him, and then we have David Kim, who um, is a professor in the Department of Industrial, Manufacture, Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering at Oregon State, who's working with um, ODOT on this project. So without further ado, I think you're going to start. Thank you, and uh, appreciate you having me here today. 
Uh, I'm also quite pleased to have Jim Mayer from the Oregonian here. Been trying to get the Oregonian interested in this project for quite some time. Uh, so this is a great opportunity. We've been in newspapers all over uh, North America and actually the world, including the New York Times last uh, March 25th. So um, pleased to have the Oregonian. Um, what generated this program? The legislature, Oregon legislature in 2001, uh, they were, the House Transportation Committee was looking at a number of uh, concept vehicles that, that, uh, that, that had come by and uh, uh, they actually rode around in. Uh, back then, a uh, hybrid electric vehicle was uh, considered rather interesting. They were, they were just beginning to enter the marketplace. We had the Honda Insight. I think the first Prius came out that year or slightly uh, the year before. Uh, they also saw uh, fuel cell cars, uh, hydrogen-type cars, and they also saw uh, 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 liquid uh, uh, natural gas, a bunch of different concept cars, and it hit upon a couple of them. What happens if these take hold in the marketplace? Because they're responsible uh, for maintaining the revenue levels to maintain our road system. And they determined that uh, it might not be good for the road revenues to have alternative fuel vehicles or hi uh, highly fuel efficient vehicles uh, in the marketplace in great numbers. So if that was to happen, uh, what would they do? And they put together a task force called the Road User Fee Task Force. Uh, and I was hired to run that task force as my first action at ODOT in 2001. This was the mandate given to the task force uh, to develop a design for revenue collection for Oregon's roads and highways that will replace the current system for revenue collection. Uh, the current revenue system is basically uh, combined of the gas tax and a number of uh, title fees or user, user type fees, registration fees, you all pay those. Uh, and uh, the concern was, of course, that the gas tax being predominant. In Oregon, 80% of our revenues are dependent upon the gas tax as of uh, 2005. Only 60% are gas tax but the truck taxes are pegged to the gas tax. So if the gas tax revenues go up or down, the truck tax revenues go correspondingly, so that results in 80% dependency on the gas tax in Oregon. Uh, the, our, our economists uh, projected uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, when, there we, when would Oregon enter into a permanent decline based on uh, the entry into the marketplace of highly fuel efficient vehicles? And they came up with these numbers. Uh, the top line, the blue line, is a base case, assumes no changes in a fuel efficiency of vehicles. So if you look at that line compared to the other, you can begin to see the gap between uh, what, what uh, would happen if there were no changes and changes that are actually already occurring today, as you all well know. The top line, the, the, the pinkish line, is uh, a line that is most optimistic. And it is a line that is based on returning to $1.50 a gallon. This was a year and a half ago, the estimate was made. Uh, I think few of us believe that we'll return there and stay there at this point. So basically, we're dealing with the bottom two lines. Uh, the, the bottom line, the, the blue line, assumes a, a fairly aggressive entry into the marketplace of the fuel efficient vehicles, and then the, the midpoint line is the, is the, pink, is the yellow line. Uh, as you can see, around 2017, uh, later uh, next decade, is when uh, uh, the uh, projections are for a permanent decline. When we say permanent, it isn't just you lose one year. You lose that year forever, and then every other year you go down. So in a short period of time, you have a tremendous deficit uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, road revenues for Oregon. And so this is why the legislature wanted us to uh, investigate alternative sources for uh, road revenue. Uh, the task force, I'll do a little brief uh, uh, explanation of where, where the task force uh, went and why they went there. Uh, they uh, came up with basically three, or excuse me, four different uh, approaches for a new system. Uh, the primary approach the, uh, is the mileage fee, a per mile charge that would basically replace the gas tax. Uh, the other three were uh, uh, tolling new capacity, 
uh, in, in Oregon. And actually, if you've been reading the newspapers, you've noticed that we're starting to investigate that at ODOT. Uh, the, th the third was a congestion pricing uh, 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 strategy that would kind of be akin to or work with the, the mileage fee, and I'll go into that in a little bit. And then the final one was a, a, a studded tire fee that actually we attempted to get enacted in the legislature in the 2003 session and didn't get anywhere. Uh, so a vehicle miles traveled fee is primary. Um, let's see. What are the collection possibilities for this? Uh, we looked at all of them. Uh, first, human, human data gathering. We thought, well, let's, let's look at maybe the motorists themselves would self-report. That was rejected fairly quickly for reasons you might guess. Um, secondly, uh, having uh, an ODOT official or some public official checking the odometers. Uh, thought we'd have a little bit more likelihood of uh, accuracy. But if you cost that out, uh, public employees are very expensive to maintain and feed. And so that one kind of went by the wayside, too. Then we look at centralized collection. And this is more akin to the Iowa project uh, in that uh, mileage is generated in, uh, in some format. Uh, both, both Iowa and, and Oregon are doing this electronically. And then it is transferred uh, to, to a centralized database. Uh, the centralized database then generates a billing and sends it, uh, sends it out uh, to the motorist for payment. Uh, this was rejected for a couple of reasons, one of which is incredibly expensive to, to operate and maintain on an annual basis. The minimum expense we, we discovered was like $50 million a year, uh, and we wanted to keep that, that operating expense down. The second reason is we couldn't figure out how to ensure that the motorist would actually pay the bill which is important. They have to pay the bill. Uh, uh, you could say, people have said tie it to the registration fees, but there are a lot of folks that operate motor vehicles without paying registration fees now. And if you noticed, or could surmise, at the service station, everybody pays the gas tax. Because they buy their fuel, and they purchase the fuel with the gas tax embedded in the price, everybody pays. So the objective here in Oregon was to get, even those who are on a cash basis, even those who, who might be operating illegally to pay. And the reasoning is even the bank robber knows how to, uh, figures out how to fill up their car before they rob the bank and get the money. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Everybody must pay in this system. The final option was collection at fueling stations, which we'll go into, and that is the Oregon concept. Uh, let's see. I think I went into some of these already. Um, one, of the, one of the big issues is this integration system here with the current fuel tax system. Uh, what Iowa, the Iowa Project and, and Oregon both have determined is that uh, it's very difficult to, 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 to get uh, uh, vehicles uh, retrofitted with, with, with electronic devices that would, be, would support the system. Uh, the, reason, the reason being is it's very expensive to do that. It, the installation cost alone is expensive. Uh, but secondly, there's cooperation issues. <coughs> we have to get people up in the foothills of the Coast Range in Coos County and, and, and uh, uh, Douglas County around Grants Pass. And there, you shouldn't really go up into those places, frankly. Uh, I, I, I've grown up in Oregon, so I can say that. Uh, uh, cooperation is going to be very difficult in a retrofitting situation. So uh, that, that's a problem, but yet uh, it will take some 20 years to, over, to turn th through the existing motor vehicle uh, fleet uh, from, from, from uh, nobody having the devices to everybody having the devices. So, but the issue is you, you must uh, install the, tech, uh, the technology into new vehicles and then let the, let the uh, system uh, take, its, take its course. Uh, so integration with the current fuel tax system is very important because you'll be maintaining that system dually with a mileage fee system for quite some time. Another issue, system redundancy. What happens if you have problems with the system? What happens if there is a difficulty with a satellite, for example? We're using GPS in this case, and so is the Iowa system, uh, or, or some other system failure, and having a backup system is important uh, to maintain the uh, revenue flow as required. And then the one that focused, Oregon focused on uh, uh, most, uh, with most focus is the ease of use 
by the motoring public. Our view was the new system should be simple for the motoring public to use because changing systems is always difficult. Uh, so you want to make it easy. So uh, my charge to the team was let's make it so that the motorist only has to do one new thing or as close to one new thing as possible rather than multiple new things. And so I think we accomplished that, as you'll see. Okay, here is the concept then. Uh, so, uh, a per mile charge. Uh, the task force uh, did not want to charge motorists in Oregon uh, on a per mile charge basis for miles driven outside the state. So there's uh, no charge for, motor for miles driven outside of state, only charge for miles driven inside Oregon. As you, if you think about it, this is much different than the gas tax in that if you f fuel up in Portland and drive across into Washington, you're driving on Washington roads, but you're not paying anything for, to do so. Or on, conversely, if you fill up in Vancouver and drive in, into Portland, you're not, you're not paying anything for drive on the Oregon road. So this is actually a more accurate system. There's also other possibilities for this. You could charge a rush hour charge, so greater, uh, greater uh, rate for, char for, for traveling during rush hour, and this is being tested in our pilot program, as well as a local option possibility. Uh, the, uh, let's say, a uh, community such as, say, Corvallis uh, wanted to raise, raise revenue in this manner. They could outline the borders of that community and charge for driving in Corvallis, and that would go towards uh, uh, the, the streets and roads in that, in that community. So that, that's a possibility as well. It's also better than the local option gas tax, Mr. Mayor, because the collection would occur any place they filled up, not necessarily simply in Corvallis, more likely to be accepted by the fueling industry. Okay, I think we're on to you now. Yep. Well, I've handed off to David Kim for a while to go through the technology, and he'll answer all technology questions. I take a pass today, and I'm happy about that. And uh, when we uh, started this project, myself and David Porter, um, with uh, our team of graduate students, were given, you know, a set of engineering requirements. And I'd say some of these requirements here um, would be more, uh, I guess, end requirements if this system was uh, eventually implemented. Um, I think we've uh, met most of those requirements. Um, I, you know, this is a test system. It, it still has bugs. It's not a multi-million. Uh, dollar commercial development system, um, but for the most part, I think we've met um, the different requirements stated uh, on this slide. Okay, let me just describe some of the main components of it. Um, from a hardware and software perspective, um, this uh, implementing this system concept uh, requires an on-vehicle device for mileage collection, and because as Jim described, we want to segregate miles driven uh, within the state of Oregon from miles driven outside the, st the state of Oregon and also potentially having miles identified within the state of Oregon if there's a particular you know, rush hour um, area or a particular, um, I guess, uh, local community that wants to, to collect mileage for that particular area. Um, that's done by the on-vehicle device. Um, there is a method to actually um, read that information on the, off the on-vehicle device when a vehicle pulls up for a fuel purchase. And that's why we have what are called the radio frequency readers at the service stations. And then um, there's kind of a whole set of software that basically controls the operation of the system. And with, with some um, graphical diagrams, I think a lot of this will become more clear. From an infra, uh, infrastructure perspective, we obviously need the help um, of the service stations and have to equip the service stations with uh, certain types of uh, new equipment or functionality, not necessarily new equipment. Uh, so here's a high-level graphical uh, depiction of the system. Um, if we start with the actual on-vehicle device, and I'll describe a little bit more later on in the presentation um, what the actual use of the GPS receiver is and how the device actually collects mileage. Um, but there is an on-vehicle device. It is going to be receiving some information from the GPS satellites. Uh, when there's actually when the the person in the vehicle pulls up to purchase fuel, um, when a transaction is initiated for a fuel purchase, that's going to initiate um, 
the system to say read the mileage off that particular vehicle. Um, that will be passed to the point of sale system in uh, the service station. The service station then is going to have to talk to a central database and um, basically it needs to do that in order to calculate the proper vehicle miles traveled fee uh, to add on to the fuel purchase. Once that is actually done, um, the fuel purchase will be added uh, to the uh, per gallon um, or, or the total fuel purchase price and then um, uh, the, the consumer can go ahead and pay for the, the gas and the fee and be on their way. Okay, so from the perspective of someone driving their vehicle with this, there really isn't any difference. They pull up, they request a certain amount of fuel to be purchased, and then they pay for it and they leave. Okay. Now, this system also has the capability in the case um, in our particular system, if uh, a vehicle pulls up and actually does not have a device on it, for example, an out-of-state vehicle or a vehicle that isn't retrofitted, um, if there is not a successful read, an attempt is made, it'll basically say, look, there is no, there, this, this vehicle is not equipped and therefore charge the per gallon uh, fuel tax. And so that's part of the system redundancy that Jim talked about. Okay, and I think basically I described most of this on the, on the prior slide and um, uh, we'll have some more uh, pictures and diagrams that describes this in more detail. Okay, this is um, a picture of the actual current on-vehicle device, and uh, uh, really this is, uh, this is kind of the brains of the device, and you can see here there is a connector here, and that connector actually connects to what's called the onboard diagnostic two port of a vehicle, and it draws uh, two pieces of information from that port. Well, one of them is not information, it draws power from that port, and it gets information on the speed of the vehicle. And that's really the basis for computing uh, the total miles that the vehicle has, tri uh, has traveled. Now also, you'll see some of these other attachments to it. There is a GPS antenna. And so there is a GPS receiver within this device. And as the vehicle is driving, the uh, device has within it um, uh, programmed roughly the boundaries of Oregon. Okay, and roughly, we've actually mapped, I think, the boundaries of Oregon with uh, so that 50, 55 points, and uh, we're finding that isn't quite enough on certain por portions of the border along the Columbia River because it snakes around so much, and we're having to approximate certain things with straight lines. Um, and then, so anyways, that's programmed in the device. So as, as you drive, let's say you cross the I-5 bridge to go into Washington, uh, the mileage collection that's collected, which is, is, is going to be kind of a constant mileage collection, is going to be sent to a different, you can think of it as uh, to a different odometer. And it's now going to say, now start to accumulate out-of-state miles because I know that this vehicle has just crossed um, the border and is no, no longer in the state of Oregon. Okay, this uh, third component here, this radio frequency antenna, that is going to be used when you actually go to the service station and um, the RF reader at the service station has to read the mileage off this particular device. Okay. Okay, as far as mileage collection, I mentioned that um, we're using the uh, output from the onboard uh, diagnostic two port of the vehicle. Uh, there are various standards that are present for um, uh, different uh, makes of vehicles that are out there. Currently, what we're supporting are these three particular standards. Um, this J1850 standard is basically most GM cars and then some Toyotas. Um, there's also a separate standard for uh, uh, Ford vehicles, and then this ISO 9141 standard is for most Chrysler and um, other foreign vehicles. Um, so what we actually have is we, we have separate devices. Um, we actually, one integrates the, the GM standard and the Chrysler foreign standard, and we actually have a separate device that we mark uh, clearly that is a Ford device. So you can't just take one of these and plug them into any vehicle you like. Um, probably too late in the game, we found out that there's another standard out uh, that we do not accommodate. Um, it's, it was a little bit more prevalent than we had first thought. Um, so we actually have another on-vehicle device that doesn't use um, the output from the onboard diagnostic two port to, to get speed and therefore collect mileage. It actually uses the GPS receiver to do uh, both functions, to actually estimate how much um, mileage uh, the vehicle has accumulated as well as to say where was that mileage accumulated at what particular area. Okay. 
and that, that was this what we call mileage collection two. Okay. And then one of the things with the um, mileage transfer here, it's just a one-way communication. Okay, so this this device isn't really reading anything from anything. It's basically just passing its mileage upon request, short range at a service station. Okay, so it does not have the capability while you're driving somewhere in Oregon to transmit this mileage to some central location. Okay, it's only within what is it about 50 yards maximum? Okay. Okay, for the purposes of the pilot test um, that we're um, just basically gearing up for now, and well, there's, there'll be more said about that later, is the current devices have actually got uh, three different geographical areas programmed into it. One of those is what's called the rush hour area, okay, and that is uh, um, most of Portland. And um, is there a term for that, the Portland, it's not the, this is the Portland metro area? Okay, and um, so for that particular geographic area, rush hour is also defined by different time periods and days of the week. So in our current test, the rush hour is the Portland area. That's the area. The time periods are an a.m. peak, which is uh, 6 to 8, no, 7 to 9 a.m., and then the p.m. peak, which is 4 to 6 p.m., and that only occurs Monday through Friday. Okay, and we also have a program such that um, the holidays through the um, through June 2007 are also excluded. So if you're actually driving on a Friday, on a holiday, from let's say at 7:30 a.m. in this particular area, it's going to recognize that that shouldn't be charged or accumulated as rush hour miles. And miles driven in this what's called a rush hour zone will then be um, collected, and uh, you can think of it as a separate odometer reading. Okay. Then we have the in Oregon. Um, zone, which is everywhere in Oregon. And the in Oregon zone can also include um, that rush hour area because that's technically in Oregon when we're not Monday through Friday in the AM or uh, PM peak times. And then there's one you can think of it as uh, odometer in the system for all mileage driven outside the state of Oregon. Okay. And if you have any questions while I'm talking about this, if that's not clear, um, feel free to ask. Okay, so that's uh, what's held internally in the device is actually you can think of as 31 separate odometer readings. Okay, that again, all, they always accumulate mileage. There's no, uh, there's no concept of a trip odometer where anything gets reset. Uh, but what's actually displayed to uh, the driver, and that is a picture of one of the displays. We actually have them being installed a little bit nicer than that. Um, you don't see a cable uh, hanging out there. That was on one of our earlier tests, is you actually see four um, mileage uh, totals. And again, these are, again, od odometer readings. They always go up. They're never going to be reset. So this is total rush hour miles that have been driven since the actual device was installed in your vehicle, the total in Oregon miles, non-Oregon. And we have one last um, category here. It's mainly for our, I guess, research purposes is um, uh, when the, uh, I'll call them the onboard OBD2 devices, the ones that actually use the onboard di diagnostic 2 speed input to calculate mileage, um, when that type of device does not actually have a GPS signal, for example, when you're driving in a tunnel or you're driving in a parking structure, it'll uh, accumulate mileage in this separate category. And basically during that time when you don't have a, have a signal, I guess uh, technically the device doesn't know where it's at. Okay. Um, so we wanted to basically see what is the magnitude of that. A couple of years ago, we did some testing with some other GPS devices in some of the forests and mountain roads in Oregon, and we lost a lot of mileage. And so that's one of the reasons we wanted to uh, put that in here. Okay, the current device actually has a more sensitive uh, GPS receiver, so so far that hasn't been um, much of an issue in the latter uh, later testing that we did. Okay. Um, the mileage transfer, as I talked about before, um, it's going to be transmitted electronically um, at the actual service stations. And I'll show you a picture of one of the uh, dispensers at one of the participating service stations. There's going to be, uh, I guess the concept is there's a wireless reader, and um, it's going to be associated with the fuel dispenser. Uh, the mileage will be read off a vehicle when a uh, fuel transaction is initiated. And again, one of the uh, big things to emphasize here is this system only has the capability for short-range communication. Okay, so if this vehicle is driving, um, someone is not going to be able to come up with a device that's, you know, it's about uh, half a mile away to be able to read anything off that particular vehicle. 
Okay, now this is one of the big challenges that we had in trying to implement this system concept, and this is a top-down view of a fuel island at a service station. The numbers here indicate uh, two sides of a dispenser that are back-to-back. -back. You know, when you purchase fuel, you drive up to one side or the other. And um, what we have here, you can see these are cars, and then the little red things are supposed to be there radio frequency antennas and we want those placed as close to the fuel neck as possible because that's kind of the consistent point relative to the actual fuel nozzle where a vehicle will be located. Um, and the blue areas here are what we define as, I guess you could call them capture zones. And so when a vehicle, that, that vehicle antenna is anywhere within here, uh, within that capture zone, we want to be able to say if a fuel transaction is started at that vehicle, that that is occurring at dispenser two. Okay, and um, uh, likewise, if you have four vehicles there, they all start fuel transactions. Um, this one has to say, when I read mileage here from dispenser one, it's going to be read from that particular vehicle and not that vehicle. Okay, and um, I guess easy, easy to say, hard to do. Um, well, let me just back up here. Okay, so really the way that this was implemented is uh, this particular, there's going to be a device on the actual fuel dispenser. It's going to talk with the device on the vehicle. In fact, it's going to talk with the devices on all the other vehicles. And then in doing so, it's going to get what's called a received signal strength indicator. And it's, it's going to basically use that to distinguish what, what vehicle, of all the, ve all, all the vehicles with devices, which one is in front of me. Okay, and so that's uh, in a nutshell how that concept uh, works. Um, there's a little bit more to it th than that, but that's kind of the, the fundamental idea. There's actually a lot more to it than that. Um, this is one, this is a pictures of one of the participating service stations in, in this um, uh, pilot test. This is uh, Leathers uh, Fuel up on Sandy Boulevard in Northeast Portland. Uh, this is one of their dispensers, and this is the location uh, where we're going to place one of those readers. And the actual a uh, reader looks exactly like um, one of the uh, on-vehicle devices that, that goes into the um, uh, vehicle. Okay, um, I don't think I'm going to skip a couple of these things. It's probably a little bit more detailed. Uh, it's really kind of detailing the different communications of all the different software components that are controlling the system. Um, <clears throat> Those are different timing diagrams that help us make sure the system is doing stuff correctly. Um, now, what happens at the end uh, is we did have to work with a point-of-sale system company okay, uh, that would modify their point-of-sale system, which is currently being installed at the leather service stations. And one of the modifications they had to, had to make for us is the ability to... Um, uh, talk to our uh, software and so when a, and tell us when a transaction is starting. Okay, so that's one of the modifications. So when they tell us a fuel transaction is started at dispenser one, we basically handle the rest and say, here, okay, this vehicle is equipped. If it has mileage, then we will actually retrieve that mileage, send it back to the um, calculated fee, and then send that fee back to the point of sale system. And then um, what it does next is it, it does a regular uh, fuel um, purchase transaction, but it then prints a different receipt, okay, and the different receipt will actually show um, the actual fuel purchase price and then what the actual net fuel purchase is when you deduct the uh, per gallon gas tax, then it'll show you what the actual mileage fee is based on the mileage read off the device, it'll add that to the fuel price and then give you uh, the total uh, purchase amount. Okay, one of the other things um, that's a part of this system uh, that I think Jim alluded to is um, as far as integrating it with the current way um, gas taxes are paid in Oregon right now. And then currently, uh, as I understand it, they're paid at the distributor level. Okay? And then when the actual service station buys gas, they've actually buying gas and have paid for that gas tax already. So when they charge that per gallon fuel tax, they're basically recovering... Um, uh, gas taxes that they've paid when they acquired their gas. Okay? So one of, the issues, one of the issues here is that uh, if a vehicle actually uh, comes in and has a vehicle miles traveled fee and they pay that, that can be 
on a per gallon basis, if you actually uh, divided that by how many gallons of gas they purchased, that could be either uh, more or less than the actual fuel tax that they paid. Okay, so there has to be some type of system here that balances that out for the actual service station owner. Okay, so in, in this case, the, the basic idea here is, um, is to have some type of what we call a truing up system. So on some periodic basis, whether that's a week or a month, um, the, the system at ODOT and the service station will basically um, keep track of how much uh, VMT charge that they actually collected versus how much gas they sold for that VMT charge. If they actually collected more VMT fees than the um, gas tax that they paid, they'll have to remit some money to the state. And then just the opposite occurs if they actually collected less VMT fees than the gas taxes they paid. And I think that's <clears throat> I think that's the end of my part. Let me take over. <laughs> yes. Have you tried putting the RF thing in the nozzle so then you know which car that it's going to instead of having that cloud around the pump? What's that? Yeah, you want to give. Yeah, we we did we did see that technology. I think when we started our study um, I don't think that it was either mature enough and also we didn't have the means to implement that as part of our solution. But we know there's the uh, solution to the pump vehicle association would be pretty simple if we had the antennas at the nozzle and also at the fuel neck just for the, because of the proximity. Um, one, of the other things, one of the other things we proposed uh, early on that would have made this whole vehicle to dispenser identification or association fairly simple as we propose that since in Oregon, the state of Oregon, you have um, attendants uh, actually filling the vehicles is that they had handheld readers and then they can actually just go up to a vehicle if it had an antenna and just read off of it and then there'd be no issue about the association because a human operator would be making that. But um, that was basically said that we, they, they didn't want to try, they wanted to test more, a more automatic type system, and so that's what we're trying to implement. Well, the reason is, is that uh, when I uh, interviewed uh, people from the service station industry here in Oregon, they said, do not involve our employees. Uh, I shouldn't say this. Uh, well, there's something about their best employees being in, uh, I won't say what it is, but suffice to say that they, there's a lot of turnover, a lot of sort of uh, transient employment, and uh, uh, a lot of yes, a lot of training issues and liability issues, and that's a pretty elegant way of saying it. Um, and so uh, they said, make it electronic. So we wanted to accommodate the local fueling industry. Again, that when you implement a new system, you have to make it as easy as possible on everybody involved. So, on, let's see, on system integration, uh, uh, we, we like, yes? We've got another uh, technical question from the web, so would you like them now or save them to the end? Okay. Well, let's, let's, yeah, let's do them at the end. Um, I don't want to go too far into this, but this uh, system integration is really the, the, uh, the most elegant part of, of this system because you're able to run the gas tax and the mileage fee charge at the same time. Uh, the problem with other systems is that there's no way to uh, have somebody pay one and then have, have, have them not pay the other in the same transaction. Uh, in the Iowa example, and I've talked to them about this, uh, you pay the gas tax, but yet you also have to pay the, the uh, mileage charge when you get your monthly bill. And then there has to be a way, if you're going to replace the gas tax, for a credit of the gas tax in some manner, it's very difficult. With this system, it happens automatically in the same transaction. Okay, I think I won't miss the rest of this. Um, let's see. So the fuel tax is maintained for non-equipped vehicles. That's important for out-of-state drivers and for those uh, during this, during this uh, transition phase when, we're, when the new vehicles are taking over uh, or being replaced, uh, replacing the old vehicles as well as tampering issues. Uh, there may be somebody who comes in and decides they want to remove the device, and then they would simply be read as a gas taxpayer. I think this probably causes resistance to remove the device 
because it, uh, manufacturers are able to place uh, for security issues uh, uh, devices in places that are difficult to get to in, in, the, in, the, in the motor. Uh, for example, my Volvo's fan is, is placed in a very difficult place because it doesn't work anymore except for on high speed and it'll cost me $500 for them to get to it. <laughs> uh, so it can be done uh, so that co cost effectiveness of tampering kind of disappears and I think that's, that's the point there. Uh, let's see, um, the truck taxes, important to note the Oregon has a weight distance uh, truck taxing mechanism. It operates much like a mileage charge for cars. And so that basically would be retained and actually be a nice complement to the, to the per mile charge. And we also could do some creative uh, peak period pricing, as I mentioned earlier, for uh, congestion issues. Privacy is an issue that comes up regularly. People hear uh, the acronym GPS and they say they're going to track us. And actually, there's been, that was the first thing that happened that caused a lot of uh, media uh, back over three years ago. Uh, when we hired Oregon State University to develop this technology, uh, one of the specifications was eliminate privacy issues. And we did that in two ways. One was to design, uh, have them design a system where nobody could follow a car around. Uh, and that's why uh, it does not operate like a navigation unit uh, that you can get in your cars now. There is no cellular transmission or any other regular transmission uh, beaming out anywhere. The only thing that uh, where there's a transmission is radio frequency, short distance, and fueling stations. So there can be no tracking from a third party uh, in any way. The second thing was to uh, make sure that there wasn't any database kept in the vehicle that could then be accessed for to record a driving history. And they've also accomplished that. I'll let them address those kinds of issues about how they accomplish that uh, in Q&A. So there really should not be privacy issues. Uh, there are still people who don't believe what I just told you. And uh, that, that's a difficulty. I think that uh, we, we know that navigation units, uh, which are much more invasive because somebody is following the driver around, are going to, are, are going to be standard equipment in GM vehicles uh, starting a, a year from now. And other, uh, other uh, auto manufacturers are going to do the same thing. So after a period of years, people will get used to, we assume, having that kind of technology in the car and realizing that the government is not tracking them, and this will become more acceptable. This system is not planned for implementation for quite a number of years. We need a second round of testing. We need to test that connection with the novel, no, nozzle idea. Uh, so further technology review will occur in years down the road. Let's see, uh, the cost. This was an important uh, element of selecting the system we did. Uh, we wanted no retrofitting because it's expensive. Uh, we wanted the components installed during manufacture to, to get the uh, benefit of, uh, of volume production. We think that these uh, devices will be, go down to probably two digits in cost rather than the three, three digits we have today for these uh, prototype devices. The service stations uh, to install the capital equipment uh, statewide, would, our economist estimates $33 million to do that. That's relatively inexpensive. It's a one-time cost and uh, it could be uh, uh, bonded uh, over 20 years, which is traditionally how ODOT pays for capital, capital expenditures and result in less than a 2% bump in the fee rate. Annual operating costs, which I talked about earlier, relative, relatively inexpensive, 1.6 million per year uh, estimated. Uh, that's roughly equivalent to the way the what the gas tax operating costs are today. So we accomplished that goal. Issues remaining. Um, there will be those that want to retrofit to get everybody else involved. Uh, we've had that come up uh, with conversations with other states and the U.S. DOT. Uh, I think probably towards the end of the 20-year phase-in period, you might want to see some retrofitting to get the last, say, 5% or so in. Uh, the mileage fee rate will be the most uh, contentious political issue uh, on putting this forward. There are people that assume that this will be a flat fee. Uh, we have not determined that, that, that the fee should be flat. Uh, the task force, however, and I, I say we meaning ODOT, uh, the task force uh, likes, likes the idea of a flat fee because they believe the uh, road system should be uh, turned into basically a public utility. So if you, if you use the road system, you should pay uh, to use the system. And uh, this system is not designed really for now. Uh, it's really designed for a period when we're entering uh, an era of continual uh, uh, search for fuel efficiency 
as uh, oil supplies d uh, decline worldwide and competition for oil supplies increases, uh, the supply of gas or the price of gasoline goes up in that kind of a scenario perpetually, at least theoretically, although we're experiencing some of it now. And if that's the case, uh, vehicles will become smaller. They'll become, uh, they'll, 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 the science will uh, be, become uh, more applied in the use of composite materials and other such ener energy saving devices. And uh, we'll see uh, vehicles can get 100 miles per gallon and beyond, and the continual search for the greater fuel efficient vehicle. We have to have a system that can manage that, that, that problem, that can generate the road revenues necessary uh, to, be, to be there uh, so that the road system can be maintained and improved as required. Uh, and then uh, interstate issues. Uh, one state theoretically could implement this, and I, I think that uh, it could be done in Oregon. Uh, the difficulty, there, are, there is difficulty with out-of-state issues. If, if a different state uh, issued a different uh, system, uh, integration would be problematic. If this federal government uh, uh, instituted a different system, that could be problematic. Uh, we are asking other states to join us in this, although they're saying, fine, you test it and see how it works, and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll follow. Um, but we are funded uh, two-thirds by the federal government. It's a $3 million roughly $2.9 million project over six years. And the federal government uh, funds a r roughly, well, about 75% of that and are, is our partner in this. There's a lot of interest in the per mile charge nationwide and <coughs> worldwide. This is not a fly-by-night operation just in Oregon. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, attention here. Yes? Is there any interest from politicians about congestion pricing or some other type of variable pricing? Cause, because if tend, not, can't you just raise the gas tax? Politicians tend not to like congestion pricing. Uh, it has to do with uh, changing or uh, uh, trying to alter people's behavior. There's a resistance to that. There tends to be a resistance to that. Not, not everybody, but generally. Uh, raising the gas tax uh, is the first option. That is what uh, is the easiest thing to do. Uh, what, what is being found all across uh, the United States, however, is that states are unable to do that. People are resistant to a, a general raise in the gas tax. Uh, it's also difficult, system, uh, it's a system solution, because the need for changing the gas, gas tax in relation to fuel efficiency always occurs, occurs after the fact. You have the fuel efficiency improvement, and then you have to demonstrate that we've lost revenues. So it's always multiple years behind the curve. We experienced this in the 1980s. Um, never got back to where we were in 1979. Never did. Uh, and so what you want is a system that is not impacted by that uh, change in the marketplace, that, that goes with the change in the marketplace without any kind of adjustment. That's the objective. Jim? Um, doesn't, uh, uh, if you have a flat fee, doesn't that create a disincentive, though, over time for more fuel-efficient cars? Because right now you're paying less if you have a fuel-efficient car, but under um, just a mileage fee you wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, that, that is the argument that's raised. And uh, there is a very complex issue. Um, if you say that uh, no matter what, uh, a vehicle that drives out on the road wants it to be there, and should it not, and ask the question, should it not have a responsibility to pay for uh, a certain, for its responsibility for it to be there? Uh, if that's the case, then you end up going towards a, a, perm, a, a flat charge. Um, if you take also into account that the uh, uh, gas tax originally was designed for transportation, to support the transportation system only. Transportation purpose was its sole reasons to exist. And that, that reason has not been changed as a matter of public policy. As a matter of market economic accident, it has changed but not as a matter of public policy. So uh, if you look at it from that vantage point, uh, a flat fee is more consistent with the transportation purpose uh, for which the revenue system was created. If you move away from that and say we should have an environmental purpose, uh, the view of the, of the task force at this point, which is an independent part of ODOT, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> is not part of ODOT at all, it's independent of ODOT, then you look to where do you, uh, where, that's a general purpose uh, as opposed to a specific 
purpose, which is transportation, it probably should be the advantage should occur gener in the general fund, which is income tax and other such thing. That is the weight that the policymakers are going to have to make at some time. And there are other issues involved. Uh, for example, if we are continually moving towards fuel efficient vehicles forever, if that's the, that's the game to be able to maintain individual uh, vehicles uh, uh, for households and persons, then uh, you're going to continually have new cars that are more fuel efficient, and the people that tend to buy new cars are the more affluent. And who buys the secondary or even tertiary market are the less affluent. So you'll have, this is something policymakers are going to have to figure out, is do we want to advantage the, the, those buying the newer cars because they, they tend to be the more affluent and disadvantage those that are poorer. Uh, in fact, the very poor drive the least maintained and most likely to be not fuel efficient uh, vehicles. It's, I'm not giving you the answer here. I'm saying these are complex questions that if for, for somebody to implement, they'll have to address this even with the gas tax uh, if, if we don't go in this direction it's, it's because that's what's going to happen. Uh, they are serious questions. There are very serious societal questions that have to be addressed. Okay, the pilot program, which you've already alluded to, is, uh, is underway. Uh, we have 280 uh, volunteers. We've done the, the pre-pilot test. I had a vehicle in my, or a device in my car for six months. Uh, it was only a three-month pre-pilot. I just didn't get it taken out for another three months. Um, and uh, let's see, the we have 280 volunteers that have signed up. And they virtually, they're getting close to uh, all of them having the devices in the cars. I think we'll finish it up this month. And then uh, uh, starting uh, around beginning of June, we'll have the, the, the actual start kickoff. They're actually driving around right now with the mileage being read, and they're going to, or mileage being to, to, uh, created in the, in the devices, and they're, and they're going to the Leathers fuel stations to be, to be uh, fueled up. But uh, the kickoff is actually the early part of June. It'll run for five months in a base, base uh, uh, test and then five months actually paying the mileage charge and or actually broken into three groups mileage charge rush hour and then a, a control group for another five months and that's the website if you want to follow what we're doing so uh, that's kind of, that's the presentation today questions uh, so what would be if we want this would it be kind of a you tell the car manufacturers, the car manufacturers put these in every car. That, that would be a nationwide thing, or you said you want the manufacturers to do it. So. Yeah. The, uh, theoretically, that could happen. It rarely happens that Oregon's, the tip of the tail is Oregon, and we don't wag the dog from there. That, that, that is very difficult for Oregon to do. California can do it, New York can do it, a few other states can do it. We cannot do it. We need the cooperation of uh, uh, other large states or the federal government uh, there's reason to believe the federal government is going to take this seri issue seriously. There is a, there's a great concern across the nation uh, with, 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 with Congress as well as all the states. They, they can see this decline in road revenues coming, and they don't know what the answer is. And so uh, they're looking very hard at what we're doing here. I, I, I doubt we could actually do this very easily uh, without the support of major states or the federal government. Uh, if you have them, then you can... Get, then you can then you can move the marketplace. Moving the marketplace by ourselves is, is uh, uh, very difficult. Yeah. Um, how is this expected to work <coughs> with the proposed uh, new toll roads? Is, uh, they, would they be off the network? Would they be on the network? That's an interesting question. Uh, if, if, we go, if we actually have uh, toll roads in Oregon, which we still have to figure out, um, uh, they would be in place way before this system would be adopted. I can't see this system being adopted for more than uh, probably 12 or 14 years, I think. It'll take a while to get there. You have to do a second round of tests. You have to get the legislation enacted. You've got to put the uh, apparatus in place. You've got to get the auto manufacturers and fueling industry cooperating. That's going to take quite a bit of time. So actually toll systems are now uh, in place uh, all over the world, and so they would probably be in place before this is adopted. Uh, it might be interesting to explore in a later generation uh, using this system to collect tolls rather than the current uh, cash system or electronic system that you find in other places. But that's a next generation thing, and it, yes, it has occurred to us. How long does it take for the reader at the pump station to read the on-car device? 
data? A matter of a second or so. Yeah, so it really doesn't add any noticeable delay to the transaction. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the, the peak period pricing, does that come right on the monitor and tells you you're going to be paying more right now? Or yeah, if there's on the actual monitor that's in the vehicle, there's a little asterisk that basically tells you what types of mileage you're accumulating. So if it's rush hour miles, accumulating the asterisk will be in that rush hour area and that's the actual odometer you'll see increasing. Has there been any consideration to tie in this with DEQ's proposal of being able to capture information as vehicles go by on the highways? Minimize cost? Yeah, I'm, I'm not all that familiar with that and no. Uh, the, the point here is not to collect information. The point here is to collect a, mile, a per mile charge, a basic revenue. Uh, there's no uh, rev uh, information being generated for any other purpose. I think over here. I'm more interested in the behavioral aspects. Mm -hmm. So I'm trading these 208 participants. Oh. 280. 208 participants. Are they self-selected? Are they volunteers? Or how, how yeah. representative are they pertaining to their or I mean? Oh, yes. We ask for volunteers, definitely. Uh, and then if they are following, go ahead. We had a profile uh, of the kind of people we wanted, and we had actually had more than 280 volunteers. So uh, some of this is uh, uh, application of the profile, but basically it had to be out in East County near these stations. Um, we we got a good, I think we got a good cross section of uh, at least Portland, Portland or Oregonians. Because my curiosity is if they are all like retired people. Uh, we, we were concerned about that, and we didn't have, we, as it turns out, we didn't have to worry about that. We got a good cross section as it was. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think, you know, to go to the system maybe in 12 to 14 years, that's not really a long time. So, are you thinking about having a fairly comprehensive package to go to the legislature? Because I'm sure you have some kind of a revenue forecast given that our infrastructure is basically um, coming to getting to be of that age where it will require a lot of money, so. Yes. Uh, at some point, uh, I, I would predict that um, political acceptance will be an easier thing to get. Uh, I can't exactly tell you when that will be. Um, so our objective all along was to prepare for that time. Uh, when the legislature starts to see revenues actually drop and recognize that they're, gonna not, they're not going to return, then there starts to be a reason to, to change the system. This happened once before that in, in my lifetime, which is in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, we had tremendous inflation plus increases in fuel efficiency of vehicles when we moved from uh, roughly uh, 11 or 12 miles per gallon up to close to 20 miles per gallon in that period of time for vehicles. We experienced a big drop off, 30% drop off in revenues. The legislature did act and raised the gas tax at that time. Uh, so that this, this uh, a, a political uh, motivation will occur if enough uh, information uh, is is shown and a recognition of a problem. We just can't predict when that will be. Our intention is to uh, once this pilot is finished, is to prepare model legislation that could be uh, adopted by a state uh, such as Oregon, and then to have this system that could be implemented. This this is a system that is not theoretical. It actually could be implemented this way. This uh, purpose was to prepare for the, uh, the, the crossing of, uh, of the political and the doable and uh, uh, be ready when that moment comes. So when this, when this uh, pilot ends, the legislation will be prepared, and then it's just a matter of when the political will shows up. Um, uh, it will not, I will not be the one that decides to go forward to the legislature on this. It'll be... Uh, either the task force can do it if they want to, but more likely it'll be the Oregon Transportation Commission or uh, uh, politicians that decide to do this. Uh, but uh, we will be feel, we will uh, consider ourselves uh, successfully concluded when the pilot ends and the legislation is prepared. Just a quick follow-up: um, What about you know uh, like farm machinery and people who will be storing fuel on on site? Yeah, that's a complex question, and the gas tax has a difficult difficulty with that one as well they get a credit against the gas tax that they have to actually apply for and send in paperwork. I, I don't think that will be necessary here. 
probably there will be a, a certain amount of uh, uh, license given to farm vehicles so they will not have this uh, technology installed or a way for it to be disabled so that they, they would not be charged uh, per mile charges uh, 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 the way the rest of the motoring public is. But that's, that is a detail that has to be worked out. A number of web, web questions, so maybe I'll just read or paraphrase one of them. Um, is there any concern about somebody hacking into the software on the onboard computer and being able to change it so they only drive five miles a year or anything like that? You know, I think there's there's a concern, but it will be really hard. It's not um, it's not an open source program. It's compiling to the microchip, so it will be really really hard for them to get to the actual source code. If we don't have any source code on the device itself. It's all compiled, so it will be really difficult. There are other ways that they could do it by tampering with the external components of the device, like the antenna, GPS antenna, or the RF antenna itself. But as as we indicated before, if somebody were to, you know, tamper with that, um, and we, by looking at the information that is collected by our database, I guess there's there's a chance that we could see with somebody driving in between fuelings, if we see a significant drop in mileage, that would be an indicator that, you know, they're trying to tamper with it. Um, but that, that's something that we've, we've looked into, we've explored, and I think, uh, you know, there are ways that they can do it, but definitely, but um, I don't know. I think the gain is minimal. So, you know, we're not that concerned about that one. Yeah, one, just to add on to that, one of the reasons that the system was de designed the way it is is that the um, on-vehicle device, again, has, um, you can think of it as multiple odometers in there. And so from the point that that device was installed in the vehicle, if you're thinking about this pilot test, and you take an odometer reading, the total mileage accumulated on the odo odometer since that device was installed should be fairly close to the total mileage on the actual device. And if it was tampered with and it was much less, you know, either the, or the de mileage device is much less, we either know that two things, either someone tampered with it or it's just malfunctioning. And so we can, we can see that. A number of questions that sort of relate to what kind of policy is going to go into the the, the uh, sort of the per, the mileage fee, including has uh, the vehicle weight or environmental cost or all these other externalities yeah. in the mileage fee. Yeah, that that issue comes up, and uh, the device can handle uh, mo uh, alteration of <laughs> rates for multiple characteristics, depending on what policymakers want to do. If uh, they want, if the policymakers would want to charge more for, say, heavy, longer vehicles than for a short, a little uh, uh, fuel-efficient vehicle, there could be a rate adjustment to accommodate that. Uh, there's nothing with the electronics that would not accommodate that. But that's something for the policymakers later to figure out how they want to create uh, a tax structure. They're very good at creating complex tax structures, if you've noticed. And so uh, if there are needs like that that develop, uh, they could be accommodated. Uh, uh, would there would there be any uh, consideration of, of of and maybe this isn't a very good question, but uh, depending on the type of road people drove drove, drove on, that, that the rate would be different. Like if they used the I five continually, you know, the rate might be a different rate versus you know city streets or something. Uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, policy makers would have to find a reason why they would want to do that. Uh, roads, uh, you know, t uh, to create a road, you have to meet certain minimum standards, and uh, they're roughly the same for every road. I, I don't know. Does anybody know from ODOT whether the interstate system is a little bit more, uh, more of a nobody knows more of a cost than than ordinary highways? I don't think so. I think they're the it, same. I mean, it would an interstate would be more expensive than a arterial. Uh, but you have more traffic to, to yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what you might be able to do potentially is uh, I isolate the revenue on the roads for uh, use on that road that's that's a possibility but that would create probably more it would have to be an acceptability for uh, m more that kind of data to be developed uh, because you'd be you'd be honing in on specific roads there's a little 
greater issue there with privacy and that you would not necessarily know when they were there, but that they were there during a period of time of, say, a week or two weeks or a month when you're filling up. And so that's a policy question for later uh, to decide whether you want to isolate the revenue for given roads or not. It's theoretically possible. Is there any consideration given to vehicles that might be operating on a fuel cell or um, alternative fuels like home produced by diesel or anything like that? That was part of the motivation to go in this direction. Uh, any, any vehicle that, ha that operates on a fuel with a BTU is actually uh, required to uh, pay uh, tax here. It's called use fuels tax in Oregon. Uh, those, those tax collection systems aren't as uh, efficient as the gas tax collection systems. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, a per mile charge could, could accommodate that and the collections could occur at those, at those fueling points. Fuel cell vehicles do have to fill up, not very often, but they do. All, the only vehicles that would have not have to fuel up would be vehicles that are all electric and with a plug-in at the home. Uh, those don't have market value at the moment because they don't have you, traveling distances is difficult. If you find yourself out past the midpoint of your fuel, you have to find somebody to let you agree to plug into their wall. People will move away from that market selection. We we, we suspect. I thought about it. Um, um, so uh, the other thing, if there was a, a home fueling in some manner, if somebody did biodiesel, somehow created enough biodiesel at their home site, they might be able to avoid that. Those are, those are problems for the future, um, probably not, not in the near term. It's a longer term issue that for actual home fueling in that manner. But the system can handle existing uh, alternative fuel systems. Actually, there's an article in Oregonian uh, that highlighted a couple of people who make their own biodiesel who pay the tax somehow. I, they were quite clear that, that they know that they're required to pay that tax and there, somehow there was a way that they paid it. So. Those, those are some responsible, they're some responsible, honest citizens. But actually, here's a question that actually someone left. And I know this is a policy decision, but has there been any discussion of linking this at all with drive or pay as you go, pay as you drive insurance. Uh, there, there could be linkage there. Uh, I know about the I know about that pay as you drive insurance. Um, uh, with with these uh, mileage counting devices in the cars, uh, it would be easier for an insurer to uh, to use to use a, a, a mileage counting system. But I don't, we have not, not actually integrated whatever technology they would require. I'm not sure what that is with this system. But I'm sure that, that would be explored down the road. No one's approached you about that. Not, not, yeah. not, precise, not, with, not about integration, no. But, but the policy considerations are similar. And so I think, you know, it's something that would be explored. Are your volunteers uh, paid or compensated in any way for participating in your study? Absolutely, we wanted to get them. Yeah, they are. They're, they're paid uh, three hundred dollars uh, that metered out in uh, installments uh, for getting the device installed, first successful read, and then you know all the way through uh, deinstallation of the device. Um, there's also the potential for some of them to make additional revenue uh, if their behavior changes. Uh, uh, I, want, I don't want to go into that because I don't want to. Uh, dirty the results of the data. Any additional questions? Yeah. Are you going to go into a larger study after this, or are you going to look into implementing it? Um, again, uh, a success for us is completing this pilot test and preparing uh, model legislation that, that somebody would have to decide to, in to uh, introduce. There is the potential, though, for something quite more significant. Uh, the administration, the federal administration, has a budget out with $100 million adequate, uh, allocated for up to five states to do large-scale pilot alternatives to, to, the, to the gas tax, basically. And uh, uh, when asked about what kind of uh, projects they were looking to, uh, uh, th this was asked of the, uh, I think it was the interim head of the Federal Highway Administration, uh, I think in March, when asked about uh, what kind of projects they had in mind, they mentioned the Oregon program as the, as, as the kind of project. So uh, with, with that kind of interest, we may uh, explore with the federal government doing this on a much larger scale. Uh, 
uh, in the next few years, provided that budget uh, is, 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 is actually approved by Congress. I got one more. What about the states that have a sales tax on gasoline? They're making out like bandits with the I think they high are, gas yeah. prices. I think they are. <laughs> Um, before we thank our speaker, I do want to make a plug for next week's seminar, which is uh, the topic is the Columbia River Crossing Environmental Impact Statement. We have someone from WashDOT and the consultant working on that report. So I um, hope to see some of you there. So thank you very much, both.